everyone, and welcome back to the Van Maren Show on LifesightNews.com. My name is Jonathan Van Maren, and today I'm going to be talking again to my friend Laura Clausen of Choice42. If you don't recognize her name or the name of her organization, you'll probably recognize her as the girl with the pink hair and all of those pro-life satire videos. She's been in videos like the Magical Birth Canal. She's in a video where she poses as one of the radical handmaids. She has a whole series of these videos that have gone viral. They've gone around the world. They've racked up millions of views, and they've resulted in not only challenging the arguments of many pro-choice people, but have resulted in many women changing their minds about abortion. One of their more recent videos that doesn't actually feature Laura herself uh, is the video on abortion as child sacrifice, which you should head over to Choice for Two's page to check out because it is really well done really chilling. I almost said it was a beautiful video and it wasn't beautiful, but it was a phenomenal piece of art that truly does highlight how horrifying abortion is. And so today, uh, Laura and I wanted to chat a little bit about the way we talk about abortion to people, because as some of you may know, there are many different methods and many different ways that people decide to communicate with women. Uh, We communicate differently depending whether we're on the streets or on campuses or on high schools or in churches. And we communicate differently depending on whether we're talking to women one-on-one and doing counseling or in different circumstances. And so I notice a lot of people want to know how Laura Clausen and the team at Choice for Two communicate with the many women that they are talking to on a daily basis, trying to dissuade from having abortions. And so I invited her on to talk about it. This is that conversation. All right, just to start off, you, uh, everybody who follows you on social media, either on your personal page at Laura Clausen or at Choice for Two, knows that you and others that work with you talk to, to women every single week, often daily. Maybe take us back and, and explain what the first few conversations you ever had uh, with abortion-minded women were like. Sure. Um, so online, my first few, I mean... It's hard to remember back, but um, basically women were reaching out just saying that, you know, they're in a tough spot and they don't know what to do. They don't know if they should choose abortion or not. And um, just starting out, we kind of went along with the things that I'd been told you were supposed to say um, by the pro-life movement, which is like you always lead with love and you're very, um, you don't say anything offensive ever. And a lot of the time you wouldn't even refer to the baby as a baby (laughs) and you would never refer to abortion as murder. It would just be like one of the three options. And then you would kind of try and somehow persuade the woman away from the abortion option, um, without saying anything offensive. Right. And, and by, yeah. offen- by offensive, you mean like calling it murder or killing or something else really uh, jarring like that? Yeah, like basically describing it for what it is. Like just, right. just right. don't talk about abortion. Just talk about your other options and don't even really address it. Um, except for like just trying to get them. I don't know. Like that's the thing. Like it just wasn't working so well. Um, and then I just found that Okay. The, the farther into this I got, the more I realized that, you know, as I, as I've, you know, the video we put out of abortion being child sacrifice and just how horrific it is Mm -hmm. and how awful it is for the baby. Um, and at the end of the day, a life is lost. Like that is so huge and heavy. And I like, that's the message that I want to get across to women. Like, do you realize what you're about to do? Like, this is extremely serious. You're actually considering murdering your own child. Like that's the thing That's what I wanted to say. And so then um, a couple things changed within Choice for Two, um, just kind of behind the scenes. And we're basically just totally free now to say whatever we want. Um, Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, we have been doing that. We have been being much more straightforward and to the point and calling abortion murder. Now, I want to back up a little bit because I find uh, this whole discussion about, uh, you know, how to how to speak out in different circumstances very, very interesting because obviously a lot of the critiques that I know you've been getting on some of the language that you use is very similar to a lot of the critiques 
uh, that we at the Canadian Centre for Bioethical Reform and the many other groups that use abortion victim photography might get because they'll say, you know, the images are harsh and unloving, even if they are, in fact, true. Uh, we can debate, well, you know, I think the truth is the most loving thing when when the alternative to telling them the truth is that they do what we're showing on the signs, which is a choice they have to live with forever. And what's interesting is that there's a quote from Greg Cunningham who always said that for, for a very small number of women, just providing options might be good enough. But he says most of them have to be more horrified by what abortion is than they are by the circumstances surrounding a crisis pregnancy. How, how does that ring to you doing the kind of work you do? Totally true. And the thing is, honestly, most of the women that we talk to who decide then not to abort, they don't need any help from us. They don't need anything they, oh, like, no. yeah. And, and we do, you know, like that's what we're known for in terms of providing, um, you know, baby registries and, or doing rent, um, mm-hmm. paying rent and all this stuff. But most of the time, probably like 70% of the time, they don't actually need anything. And they just needed, um, really to be confronted with the truth about what they were going to do. That's it. And so we keep in touch with them. Like we have emotional support and we have our support groups and stuff like that, but there's not really a, like a financial crisis or something like that, that would be preventing them from not killing their baby. They just haven't been hit totally with the fact that they're considering murder and it's wrong to murder. Now, so what's interesting, and I want to kind of do a chronology now for people who are listening, because again, most people will be familiar with you as the person in the just saying videos, right? In the Magical Birth Canal, uh, the Radical Handmaids video, and, and, and you know, the en- entire roster of videos in that series. And what most people won't know is what the work you do behind the scenes looks like. And and so one of the things that you and, and your colleagues at Choice for Two, uh, all the many volunteers you work with, is you're talking to women in crisis pregnancy. I noticed that I see almost every other day on one of the pages that you run, another baby has saved another mother who's chosen life. I think you told me one point, I don't know, a few months ago, you said, look, at least three babies are saved every single week. And, and for myself, I'm always very interested in what's the most effective way to talk to somebody in different circumstances. Cause of course, you know, we talk to people outside high schools, we talk to them on campuses and the principle that we abide by is first, it has to be moral, right? We won't do anything unbiblical, but then it has to, be effective. And so there are people who would say, for example, well, we think that using, you know, images like this, we just don't think it's the right thing to do. Some people might say, well, you know, telling a woman that choosing abortion is choosing murder might be, um, you know, it's the wrong thing to do. For myself, if it's effective, we should be doing it. So when, when did you make a shift in the way you were personally talking to women? You said you noticed that it wasn't working as effectively. Could you give us like a real example or two of conversations where it just didn't go the way you wanted it to? And you were like, I should be saying something else to really drive this home. Yeah. Um, so like, I do have an example, exactly that of a woman. Um, and I've been, I've walked with her now through two pregnancies, the first one she aborted and the second one, um, she kept the baby and this child, um, her name is Chloe. She is the reason she's when I made the switch and she is, I guess like a year and a bit now. Um, so this would have been like almost two years ago. So anyway, before Chloe, the mom was pregnant and um, she was reached out to me and she was chatting and, you know, she was really upset about everything. And I was just, you know, trying to encourage her and, you know, you should, you know, you choose life, you can do this, um, all this kind of stuff. And we went back and forth for quite some time, actually, like weeks. And then one day she messaged me and she was like, I had an abortion yesterday. Mm. And I was just like, what? Like, no. Um, and I, and I have everything recorded because it's all, everything we do is online in text. Right. Right. So I could just go back and read through the conversation. And I did that. And I realized I was like, I didn't do everything I could to save this child. I did not say the things I should have said. Um, and now she's gone and murdered her, her kid. And she immediately like when she wrote me, I had an abortion yesterday and I, it was wrong. I, it was the wrong choice. And, you know, she's just really upset. And it was, 
it was hard for me to even deal with her immediately because, sure. you know, she's, she's killed her own child and, and now she's hurting. And I'm like, yes, of course you're hurting. Right. <laughs> um, and anyway, so kind of got over that. I, um, you know, I reached back out to her and was kind of talking with her through her post-abortive stuff. And as so often happens, women get pregnant a second time, like really soon after having an abortion. And um, with that one, you know, I already had this whole rapport with her. And so I was like super straightforward. I was just like, you know what? You can't murder this child. Like, do not murder this baby. And then right away she was like, no, you're right. That's what it is. It's murder. And she's like, I can't do that again. And so that was the first kid where I actually used the murder word. Right. And um, yeah, so Chloe got to be born. Um, and with that, I just started sh shifting because I was like, what am I doing? Am I trying to like magically sway women away from murdering someone? Or am I like actually for the baby in this situation uh, when no one else is? And am I actually going to really speak up and speak truthfully? Um, I like how you said that, like, it's the truth. I'm not making up any sort of scary yeah. situation about what she's yeah. talking about. She's talking about murdering her child. Yeah. Um, and that's just the truth. And so I'm not doing all I can for the child and for her if I don't say that. And so that's when the switch happened. And I guess a lot of people notice that too online because not just our conversations with women behind the scenes, um, but the stuff that we're posting, reaching out to women, right? Like we just kind of post stuff and put it out there and then women respond to that. Mm -hmm. And we've gotten a lot more, as people will say, harsh, I will say truthful. And we've gotten a lot more women reaching out to us. Now, this is this is something that I want to to take a closer look at because I always say there's there's two primary methods by which the pro-life movement does its work. And I find that a lot of people believe in what I call marketing, which let, let, let's just attract them to our position, right? Um, this is like, like choose life. This is like, this adoption is a loving option. We have support, all that. And then there's social reform, which is turning people off of something, right? Abortion is horrifying. It's an act of violence. Um, like our, our images show that it, it, it dismembers, decapitates and disembowels a human being created in God's image. It doesn't get worse than that. Um, and that a lot of people will judge social reform tactics by marketing standards. And a lot of people just don't seem to understand why that would work. So when you first told me, no, the reason we're making this switch is not just because like I've decided I'm very fond of the word murder or I'm very <laughs> fond of super blunt language, but I'm using it because I find that when I use it, more women are deciding to keep their babies and not have abortions. That made sense to me because I was like, well, that's exact. I don't like using abortion victim photography and I like it less than, than my critics do because I have to see it way more often. And it's just exhausting sometimes to have to look at it this much, right? Because you can never forget how big of a deal this is. And so when you're using this language and you're using the standard of this is the most effective way, why is it that some people don't seem to believe you that this is, is working? Because for me, I saw the shift in the language, but I also saw that you're posting increasingly more and more testimonies like this man be say this week, another mom chose life. Um, you're posting screenshots of like you calling abortion murder and then her being, well, I never thought about it that way. I'm actually not going to have the abortion. And for me, if it's working then then we should be doing it like that that is the principle because we're talking about real lives here yeah i think like yeah i totally agree yeah with all of that and and too i guess what happened was i'm really thinking of this more as a human rights issue and like pregnancy resource center and all of that it kind of just seems i'm not trying to downplay it but the way people think of it or they'll they'll say it's a past like our ministry is a pastoral ministry right. um reaching out and helping women and very loving and you know all really great um but when when you know you understand that we're slaughtering babies this isn't just like a lovey-dovey let's have a support group and feel good about things it's like children are being killed brutally yes and so that's kind of where my mind is at. And so I, yeah. And so I am, you know, being a lot more um, blunt, truthful, harsh, whatever you want to say. Mm -hmm. And I think that people find it hard to believe because uh, maybe it's just something that 
people haven't done before. I'm not sure, like meshing the um, the help of things with the truth of what abortion is. Because honestly, when Choice for Two started out and we got a couple years in, and then especially when we started changing our language, I thought, should we split the organization into two right. and have kind of the more activist side and then have the more like pastoral side? I was thinking about it and I was like, no, this is why we're working. It's because we're both. Um, and it, it doesn't seem like it would work, but even the fact of like our satirical videos and stuff, that's how we get the reach on the internet. Mm -hmm. We haven't hit a million views with any of our, um, stories about women choosing life. And those are great stories and, and they're, you know, helpful to be on our website and women have chosen life looking at them, but those aren't the ones that spread around. It's more this, um, straight to the point type of message um, that gets out there. And so that's part of our plan because we're, we're reaching the women in that way. Yeah, no, it's interesting. I remember you saying once that you don't mind the trolls because when they show up and they're like hating on you, but sometimes the trolls get pregnant and then you're there to help them when they need it. Yes. And actually I was just thinking about it because I I've been, you know, this week has been particularly bad for the trolls mm -hmm. um, in terms of even one of my people on my page commenting someone sent a package to her home address um, with some nasty stuff in it. So they're messaging me being like, you need to block all these trolls because this is getting out of hand. <laughs> right. And I understand that. And I understand how upsetting they are, but I for sure know that three babies are alive because of the trolls, two boys and a girl, um, because they share my stuff into other pro-choice groups being like, okay, guys, everyone get on here. And, you know, I don't know, whatever they think it is that they're doing, um, attacking or whatever, leaving nasty comments, everyone get on here. And through that, and them sharing my stuff around three women who were pro-choice ended up connecting and keeping their children, like canceling abortion appointments. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's why I keep them around. Yeah. You know, and it, another uh, another aspect of this is I remember often when we're dealing with a something as bizarre as killing babies, one of my colleagues said to me recently, I hope I never stop thinking about how strange it is that we have to do this, like yeah. how absurd it is. Like, I hope I hope it never becomes normal that we're doing this. And I remember that that really hit me because we often sort of almost get used to talking about it. And then we have to remind ourselves of how horrifying it is. I remember uh, you you would know who he is, but John Barrows, who stands outside a, a clinic yeah. in Orlando. And usually we're out there with our team, you know, in the time of travel uh, in the pre-COVID era, we'd be with him at least once a year with our whole team. And he always says that because people are breaking down and, and they're really impacted by it, that it always reminds him again, what he's looking at. Cause he almost gets used to it. You have to work at remembering how, how awful this is. And so sometimes we forget that, when you hear this for the first time, it really makes an impact on you. And that can help people truly understand what it is that we're talking about. Like when I was doing my research for the book, Seeing is Believing, Why Our Culture Must Face the Victims of Abortion, I interviewed some heads of, of crisis pregnancy centers who use abortion procedure videos and dead baby videos um, of aborted babies in, in their clinics. And they, they reported an absolutely astronomical spike in, in women changing their minds once they saw that. And it was like over a 60% jump in some instances before when they had just been um, using sort of the more traditional approach, which is often very vague about what abortion's all about, um, often sort of follows the lead of what the client says, which means you're not really giving them the full truth before before they're out of there. Um, right. And so have you ever had somebody when you're talking to them and you call it murder them, get angry at you, and they're angry that you, they use that language, but that language still uh, triggered them to change their mind and keep their baby? Yeah, that's usually how it goes. Um, I usually use that word like very early on in the conversation. And a lot of the time they are, t you know, offended by that. Like, that's like, what, <laughs> like, if, mm -hmm. how could you, how could you say that to me? Like, that's not what it is. This isn't murder. And then I'm like, well, yeah, that's, that is what I believe. And so, you know, here's some information on what your baby looks right now and on how your baby looks right now. And you tell me what you think killing your own child should be called. Um, and I'm not, that's it. The thing is that people are always like, you, you can't be screaming murder at women. And I'm like, I am not screaming because first of all, it's, it's online. Um, so, 
you know, we're, we're typing. Um, but also we, they reach out to us and we're very, um, supportive of them. Like we understand they're in a, in a tough spot. Like, like we get it. This is a really, this is a really hard situation for her uh, at the same time we're going to defend that baby. Um, but yeah, that is usually how it goes. We use the word murder. They get upset. Um, or that's also sometimes just that's, that's it right away. It's that one sentence and they're like, Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah, you're right. So what are my other options? Give us a bit of a blow by blow. Um, uh, because a lot of people who are just seeing your public page and maybe haven't seen all of the posts or aren't aware of sort of, um, the strategy that informs what you're doing. Um, it would be helpful for them to realize what you're doing. So I know that sometimes you, you make posts and your goal is to drive up reach. So more people see the post, but then you also have these different private Facebook groups that you divert people into. Like I'll see you make a public post sometimes and it'll say, I know that a woman considering an abortion is watching this post and doesn't think she can do it. Everybody, you know, pile on and do encouragement in the comments. What's your social media system sort of set up to do? So all of the counseling that we do and the one-on-one -on -one, it's all behind the scenes. Um, whether it be through, you know, the messenger or email or other support groups that we have, it's all private. People don't see any of that um, unless sometimes, like you said, I'll, I'll take a screenshot of something that, which I have permission from the woman to do. Yeah. Um, so like we, we have this whole conversation and we are um, doing all of the supportive nice things. Like I'm friends, uh, with a lot of the women who have reached out for help and, you know, I get baby pictures monthly of their kids still, and their kids are like one or two now, which is awesome. Um, so we have this whole rapport and our whole team, um, gets involved with each woman. Um, I don't want to go into too much detail as to how we're doing that just because of all of the negative people, but we have a whole behind the scenes system. That's what we're doing all day. Um, and that's where we connect with the women. And so, yeah, sometimes I'll do like a, this person, um, I think needs some encouragement and I ask them ahead of time if I can do that. And that really impacts them as well. Uh, just to see, um, sort of like a public opinion that, you know, choosing life is the right thing to do because so many of them throughout the education system have been taught that aborting your baby is a completely normal, fine, healthy thing to do. So for them to see all of these people uh, saying, don't murder your baby, uh, you know, we'll help you. That plays a huge role uh, sometimes in them keeping the child. One of uh, one of the things I wanted to ask you, because you do work in what would be colloquially referred to as as the pastoral arm, because you guys have baby registries, you're there to help if they need it, is because of our work on the streets and 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 the number of people that we talk to one on one about the the abortion decision. And now I, I want to emphasize here for for any listeners who who might bristle a little bit. I think that the beautiful ads of, you know, two parents with a beautiful baby, I think they're wonderful. I like them very much. But one of the things that I, I want to uh, say is that I, I do often think that they miss the target audience because the people that uh, we speak with are generally not, and I say generally, there are some, but generally not in a committed relationship with a guy who's going to be a loving father. And often when they look at a sign with, you know, like a good looking couple with a beautiful baby, they're looking at something that seems attainable, unattainable to them. And yeah. additionally, in, in many cases that I've seen, they actually think that they need to get an abortion to get that because if they yeah. keep the kid with the guy that they currently have, it's going to be way harder to find another boyfriend. It's going to be way harder to find Mr. Right and get married because they have a, a kid with a different unsupportive dad. And so to many of them, it's like, I have to have an abortion right now. So I get to have that beautiful family on the picture in the future. Is that your experience too? Or how does that ring to you? That's so true. Um, and, but I think like, that's why, that's why we don't do that. It, yeah. Cause the target audience, as you say, is not usually that, but the thing is, like it is probably true that it having it, the child might make it harder to mm -hmm. find a guy like that. I don't know. Um, but it doesn't matter because, you know, we try and keep the focus on the child that this is your baby right here and right now. And so, you know, you already made the choice. You 
you know, you chose to have sex and now you're pregnant. And so now you're dealing with another person. So like, yes, this might make your life harder in some ways, um, but it is the right choice because murdering your child is wrong. Um, but also what, like in hands down, aborting your child makes your life harder. Mm -hmm. Oh man, I can't even, I'm still like grasping, I think the level of despair that women face um, after aborting their child. Uh, it's, it's just horrific. Um, so that is, that is the worst right there for her. So. Mm -hmm. Now, when you look at, so I, I often find that the pro-life movement writ large is it, it, that we're in a bit of a bubble because many of us, certainly not all of us, not even everybody who, who, who works for my organization or volunteers for some of the groups I know, but many of us had the privilege of having a, a cohesive community that we grew up in. Right. Um, we have we have great parents, um, other family members, and we often sort of assume that people have to make one or two good decisions and then they can have the same life. And I, I sometimes wonder if if the reason so much of our, our marketing is is oriented towards you could have this doesn't fully recognize many of the barriers that people have to actually having that. Like the, the barriers are a lot more than make one or two right decisions. Like our culture is so deeply broken and the, yeah. and the brokenness is, it's not just intergenerational at this point. In in many cases, we're talking three generations in, um, yeah. they don't know what, what functioning looks like. They, it's not that they've ever even like, you know, rejected Christianity. They've never heard it before. Um, yeah. they've, it's not like they've rejected the anti-abortion world of you. They've never heard it before. And do you ever feel that just sometimes we we aren't fully cognizant of just how broken everything is around us and therefore don't realize how how clear and loud our call for truth has to be for people to wake up and hear it yes i think that our team now like realizes <laughs> how broken things are um cuz it's really hard and, and now we've been having a lot of um like women that are on reserves up north, um, getting in contact with us mm -hmm. even, and that is a whole different ball game. Right. Um, yeah. And it's, it's so hard. It's so hard to say like, okay, you know, choose your baby. Things are going to be fine. Cause like, where are the supports for them? Um, and yeah, there is no guy. They, there are no parents that are going to support them. They're on drugs. Like, it's just, it's so messed up. Mm -hmm. um, so. Yeah, honestly, this world just needs Jesus. Like that's <laughs> there's there's no other way that we can um have a person have a complete life change. And the women that I do know that came out of uh completely broken situations and who kept their children, the ones who've really turned it around are the ones who've become Christians. Right. And that's that's pretty much it. Uh, other people are still kind of struggling along and it's it's still wrong it would have been, you know, it's wrong for them to kill their child, even though their life isn't going to turn into this wonderful um, thing that child still deserves their life. But yeah, it, it's really hard because yes, the marketing, you know, I haven't really thought about this as, until you've said it right now. Um, and it's so true because that that's really quite unattainable for most. No, and I've thought about that a lot just because I, I found that a lot of the a lot of the messaging is designed for how would I respond to something, right? It's sort of designed the way we talk to Christian kids at Christian schools when we tell them not to sleep around, right? Like, yeah. don't do this, don't make these bad decisions, and you could end up with this, right? It's sort of like a you're holding out for something better. And and I agree with all that. And I and I think a lot of that stuff is, is beautiful, and I've I've used plenty of it myself. I just think that for the target audience of a abortion minded women that it, I find it frequently doesn't do what we want it to do because a, they'll look at a picture of a beautiful family and they might even think I need to get an abortion so that I can have that one day, but I can't have that now and not with this guy. And also that it actually might seem so unattainable that it's not relevant enough to their situation to convince them not to have an abortion. And in that case, uh, in your case, the way the way that you're talking, in our case, it'd be what we're showing people, the only thing really capable of cutting through what could be a lot of despair, a lot of confusion, perhaps coercion or abuse, is the the one thing worse than all the garbage you're going through would be to kill your own baby. Yeah, exactly. Yep. <laughs> and so 
I have another question on that front, just because I see people asking you a lot of questions online, and I'm curious as to what your long answer to this would be. What do you tell someone then um, who you know that they're in a really dark, awful situation, that there is a lot of justifiable despair, and that a lot of the questions they have about whether or not they can make it are hard to answer? How do you guys respond to that, and how do you... I, I know what you do to help. I know you set up baby registries. I know you guys uh, connect them with, with local churches or, or local resource centers or whatever you have at your disposal that is is close enough to be of use. But w- what do you guys say to them to help encourage them? Well, that's where we um, plug them into our online support groups. And those groups are very active. Like the women are writing in and talking with each other every day. Um, so that is a very good thing because they can relate to each other and they, you know, some of them have some really messed up lives and they're able to encourage each other. And then we also have um, the women on our team who are uh, very supportive and, you know, they're Christians and they're just coming alongside encouraging these women. So that's one of the main things that we do do. It would be through our, our support groups, but, and I know you mentioned it, like we are um, connecting women with their churches, but that is something that I've been doing even more so. And um, um, some churches have actually set up programs, which we've benefited from, which is amazing. They have programs in their churches where they're training women on how to speak with, um, you know, women who are considering an abortion. And then they actually pair them up one-to-one And they become a mentor and they meet in person like once a week or even more. Um, And these women walk with them through the pregnancy and then even after. So it's this incredible system of support. And then ultimately, a lot of the time, the woman ends up, you know, being brought into the church. And that is where that is where the lives can change her life and her child's life. So uh, we've really been focusing more on that. And I now have this huge network of pastors um, which has just been incredible to see the relationships happening there. And, and there we have actually seen lives turn around. When people ask you, what should I say? So let's just get practical for listeners for a minute. Uh, yeah. There's going to be a lot of people listening who are wondering, well, what would I do if I was talking to my friend or a peer or just I knew I, I, I get this question um, semi-frequently where we'll have somebody ask our group like, I know somebody's considering having an abortion. What should I say to them? Based on you using many different approaches and having talked to, is, is it safe to, it's safe to say hundreds, I assume, correct? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I assumed. So based on talking to hundreds, probably much more than that, um, wh- how would you advise they approach that conversation sort of step by step? How would you advise them? And w- if they have a very short amount of time, what would you advise them to say and then they can walk away from that conversation knowing they did their very best to save that baby's life. Right. It kind of, so it kind of depends on your relationship with them already. Um, so if you have a relationship with them that can sometimes make it even more complicated. Um, but for like for us and for anyone online um, or that kind of thing, I find. So the thing is, though, women are reaching out to us. So we're not hunting them down. They come to us. And so um, the first thing we do is just ask them about their situation. And we are very empathetic or sympathetic, um, depending on who on our team is talking with them, um, just about their situation and acknowledging that they're in a really tough spot and that, you know, their fears are valid. And then, but then right after that, we, I will usually say like, you know, girl, you're, you're going through a really hard time right now. Um, but please don't murder your baby. Like this is your own child and you are the only one who can support or can protect him or her right now. Um, I usually put that in like straight up and I'm not shouting murder at her. Right. I'm, I'm putting it within the context of I, I care about you. And I will also also say like, I'm on your team and I'm also on your baby's team. Mm-hmm. And right now your baby doesn't have anyone in their corner. Right. They have no one. Um, and so I'm on your team and I'm on your child's team and I don't want to see you choose to murder your own child because I know what that means for your baby. And I also know what that means for you down the road. Um, so just stuff like that. And then if she does, um, well, if she's still, you know, they'll have some of them who are like, uh, well, (laughs) 
you'll have some of them who, and I don't know why they contact us in the first place, but they'll, they'll ad- acknowledge that it's murder and they'll still do it. Right. Um, so there is that. Um, and then there's some who need a little more prodding and we'll pull out the, um, the images of live babies at the same age that her child's at. Um, and then also we'll say, you know, if, if it comes to this, <laughs> we will pull out and I ask them, I don't just like send them gory pictures or send them the procedure videos. I'll say, you know what, you're considering doing this. So, you, you know, can I please show you what you're about to do? Um, and then I'll usually send like the live action procedure videos. And those are very effective because they'll see exactly what they are signing their child up for. Yeah. I We found those videos really, really effective as well. What would, yeah. what would you say is the main objection to way, the way you do things? The way you explained it's really helpful because I think some people have this vision of you with a bullhorn up against, you know, the speaking section of your phone and screaming, don't murder your baby at them. But it is important to know that in context, you know, it, it's a conversation where you're explaining you're on their team and all of that. What is the main, the main response to what it is you're doing? Like, do you find that people just say it's not effective or just that they think it's the wrong way to do things regardless? of whether it's effective? Uh, I think a lot of people are seeing that it is effective. So um, honestly, the main objection, yeah, I guess has been from the pro-life movement that that just doesn't like the way we're doing it. I guess things have been done a certain way right. for so long. And like even within training at cr- uh, crisis pregnancy centers, you're you're straight up told you can't say, murder. Yeah. You have to use the language that she uses. If she doesn't call it a baby, you can't call it a baby. And this whole, this whole web of things that I, I felt stuck in at one point. Um, so I, so I get it. I, I hope that people will just like look at it because like, I would not be doing this if we weren't getting results. Right. Yes, that's exactly what we always say. Yeah. yeah like that would just be st- stupid. Like <laughs> we're getting results. Um, so I hope that people can just realize that. And like, you don't have to do the the things that we're doing. Yeah. That's the other funny thing is that um, get some messages about how we're not helping anyone. We're hurting the movement or we're doing all this. And I'm like, well, you're free to do what you want to do. Right, you know, right. like go ahead and set up your like flower shop where you're going to send a woman chocolates who's considering abortion or something. Like, I don't know, like this is what we're doing and it's, it's working. So I just, yeah, I just hope people look at it and just can see that. You know, and that's, that's one of the reasons I wanted to talk to you about this is because what I found encouraging is that uh, when we started using abortion victim photography on a wide scale in Canada, um, I'm not going to lie. This won't come as a surprise to any of the listeners, but we got a lot of pushback um, and we got a lot of pushback. I, what surprised me the most was how much pushback we got from other pro-life groups who didn't like the way we were making them look. Um, and I remember saying, I, I, I don't remember my part of my job description being making us look good. Like my job is to, is to change people's minds and save babies. And if that's, if that's working inside the boundaries of what's moral, it would be my only, my, 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 the only thing I'll see, right? We can't do anything unbiblical or immoral, but unless you convince me that I'm being unbiblical or immoral, then my standard is going to be what's most effective at saving lives because I, that's what, that's what we signed up for. And you know what? We get yelled at all the time, you know, like the number of, you've seen, you've seen the videos, right? I think we had like, we had 65 incidents one year, um, violent incidents in the city of Toronto alone with our activists. Like, as, as you say, we're not doing this because it's fun. Um, we're doing this because we think it's effective. And so if we're getting pushback, we have to, we have to recognize that, that there is going to be pushback if we're effective. Like as Greg Cunningham said, effective reformers are rarely liked and liked reformers are rarely effective. Um, and I, and, and it's nice to make friends, but that's not our primary job when we're doing this. So I guess, yeah, just, just to sort of wrap up, um, let's end on a, on a very encouraging note because I find a lot of, of, of the posts you make about the babies that are saved very effective. So like in, in a month, let's say, in a month or in a week um, for our listeners, how, how often do you see somebody who was going to decide to have an abortion um, choose life instead? A very, like, oh, maybe two women a week right now, it kind of goes in droves. 
of we will have a lot all at once and then it kind of settles down. We're in a little bit of a settled down time. I know right now our team is actively working with about 15 women. Mm. Um, and we don't consider the baby saved until it's born either. That's the other crazy thing is that, you know, and it's it, because of our laws and laws in the U S and like you, you really yeah. can abort at, you know, almost any point. Yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah. But anyways, yes. Um, we have a lot of women reaching out to us and all of our different platforms. It's hard to say, but I think like two a week, maybe. I actually, I changed my mind. I do want to ask you another question that I just thought of when you said that. How how do your team, because you guys do things online, which means you don't have to find times when you're out doing outreach on the streets or on campus. You kind of have to be on all the time. How, like, do you ever sleep or like, how do you function with that? Because that's the thing about, I imagine you're talking to a lot of people very late at night because they're, they, they're talking to you on messenger and like, how is that? You, you know, you have, you have your own, you have your own life going on sort of in the background. Um, are you just kind of messaging women nonstop or? Um, yeah, well, yeah. So nobody's paid. So I can't be like, yo, you're going to be on <laughs> this, this amount of time. Um, we do have enough women now that there's always someone available to pop on. And we do have a whole system where women kind of go through different stages, whether it be like the initial contact, whether we are verifying them, you know, whether we're connecting them. So there's different women on my team who are in charge of the different stages. So the women that contact us are kind of passed along through that. And honestly, yes, um, most women reach out in the evening. And that is when everyone on our team um, has the time to be engaging. So it just happens to work out very well. Um, I've never had to like, um, kind of shut down my life for what I'm doing, um, to talk to a woman, maybe a couple times, but it's not really like that. Even if we're in a, a long-term like conversation over weeks, they don't write during the day usually because they're working as well. They write during the evening. So it all just kind of works. I guess it could have been a huge problem if we'd just been like, yeah, getting an onslaught of <laughs> cries for help mm -hmm. uh, all throughout the day. It's just, it's not like that. So right now it's, it's working. We have enough people to handle it. It's just, it's just working well. How do you and the team cope when somebody you've been talking to for a long time goes ahead with it? Uh, we just talk about it. You know, we have all of our our own then um, messaging system. And yeah, I, it's just really frustrating. We just try and encourage each other and um, pray for each other. And it is really hard. I can think of like kind of each team members first one um, it, and it's just really, it's really, uh, it impacts you a lot. Mm -hmm to know that you were the person that was trying to save a child and the child's now dead. Yeah. Um, yeah. So we just, we're always in contact. We're always messaging each other more so than women throughout the day, just trying to figure stuff out. Um, but we've all become probably really good friends as well. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to talk about all this. Yeah. Thanks for, thanks for having me. Ladies and gentlemen, that was my conversation with Laura Clausen of Choice for Two. I hope you enjoyed this conversation. If you want to check out past conversations or sign up for future ones with pro-life, pro-family, anti-abortion activists from around the world and across the country, head over to LifeSiteNews.com, click on the podcast tab. You'll find all of our shows there, and you can subscribe on whatever your preferred podcast platform is. Once again, thanks so much for listening, and we hope you'll join us again next week.